Welcome to Conference Coverage, presented by ReachMD on XM Radio and powered by Health Day, featuring the latest research findings from the 2011 Annual Meeting of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, held April 30th through May 4th in Washington, D.C. I'm Dr. Matt Bernholtz. And I'm Sue Berg. This year's meeting attracted approximately 4,500 participants from around the world. The conference highlighted recent advances in the prevention, detection, and treatment of conditions impacting women. Presentations focused on fibroids, pregnancy, pelvic pain, breast and ovarian cancers, hormone imbalance, psychological issues, and overall health and well-being. Two popular estimation equations for assessing renal function, the modification of diet in renal disease, or MDRD, and the Cockcroft-Galt equation, or CG, are not optimal for accurate assessment in pregnant women. This was the finding of Dr. Bruce Rogers of the State University of New York at Buffalo and colleagues. Renal function is directly measured by the glomerular filtration rate, but this can only be measured directly in a research laboratory, which is not practical in the clinical setting, or with radioisotopes, which is contraindicated during pregnancy. Investigators examined the accuracy of the two estimation equations in determining creatinine clearance in pregnant women at risk for renal impairment. Their results showed that the CG equation was lacking in both accuracy and precision during pregnancy. Meanwhile, the MDRD equation was found to be only modestly accurate during pregnancy and it lacked precision. Lead investigator Dr. Rogers said that the inadequacy of both estimation equations was even more evident in obese pregnant women. A novel progesterone vaginal ring may provide effective luteal phase supplementation for patients undergoing in vitro fertilization. That was the finding of Drs. Kaylin Silverberg and Brandon Howard of the Texas Fertility Clinic in Austin. The investigators randomized about 3,000 women to a novel weekly progesterone vaginal ring versus a daily 8% progesterone vaginal gel. Clinical pregnancy rates in both groups were found to be within nationally reported ranges, independent of duration or diagnosis of infertility. The authors write that the progesterone vaginal ring appears to be effective for luteal phase supplementation in IVF, regardless of duration or diagnosis of infertility. A separate study found an association between cigarette smoking and postpartum depression. Researchers at the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in Baltimore evaluated data from a stratified random sample of about 8,000 mothers who delivered between the years of 2004 and 2008 and completed the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System survey two to nine months postpartum. 13% of non-smokers reported depression in the survey compared to 22% of women who smoked 10 or fewer cigarettes per day and 29% of women who smoked more than 10 cigarettes per day. The investigators also found that depression was more common among heavier smokers who had not completed high school and in non-Hispanic black mothers. The authors concluded that since postpartum depression appears to be a significant comorbid condition among new mothers who smoke, smoking cessation programs targeting new mothers should possibly include screening and treatment for depression. For women with chronic hypertension or peripartum cardiomyopathy, the impact of cardiovascular disease on future fertility plans depends on both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. This is the finding of Dr. Julie Chor of the John H. Stroger Jr. Hospital of Cook County in Chicago and colleagues. Investigators interviewed 10 women with peripartum cardiomyopathy and 20 women with chronic hypertension in order to evaluate factors affecting these women's ability to either avoid unplanned pregnancy or plan pregnancy safely. They found a spectrum of degrees to which women considered their cardiovascular disease in the context of their reproductive health, including questions about future fertility, contraceptive use, and pregnancy termination. Among the study's participants, the impact of cardiovascular disease on future fertility planning was affected by non-modifiable risk factors such as the context of diagnosis and reproductive health experiences, as well as modifiable factors such as the setting of contraceptive care and conceptualization of the risk. The investigators say these factors must be addressed in order to optimize reproductive trajectories for women with cardiovascular disease. 
Investigators at Tufts Medical Center in Boston developed a reliable, validated survey to identify factors influencing OBGYN attitudes about practicing in the current medico legal environment. The researchers surveyed a sample of 10,000 OBGYNs practicing in the United States. Of 733 physicians in general OBGYN practice or maternal fetal medicine with complete data available, 75% had been named in a liability lawsuit, and 31% had an ongoing claim. The survey also revealed that medical liability resulted in overall diminished quality of life in 30% of these physicians, lower job satisfaction in 37%, and feelings of anxiety or depression in 33%. In addition, 82% of physicians reported that medical liability caused some stress or a great deal of stress in their lives, and 66% stated that medical malpractice negatively impacted their personal financial status. And as a result, 50% reported that medical liability caused them to be more diligent in providing patient care. The authors conclude that the impact of medical liability is more than financial and affects both the physician's quality of life and the care they provide to their patients. For women with gestational diabetes, there appears to be no significant difference in weight gain between clinic patients and private patients. That's the report by investigators at St. Peter's University Hospital in New Brunswick, New Jersey. They performed a retrospective chart review of 64 consecutive clinic patients and 41 private patients for six months. No significant difference was found in the average weight gain in pounds between clinic and private patients. Also, differences in ethnicity and level of education were not significant factors on weight gain for women with gestational diabetes. And in a retrospective case control study, robotic-assisted laparoscopic myomectomy, or RALM, demonstrated some benefits over abdominal myomectomy. Investigators evaluated 122 patients with symptomatic lyomyomata who underwent either RALM or abdominal myomectomy. They found that operating time was over two hours longer with the RALM method compared with abdominal myomectomy. However, RALM was associated with less blood loss, about 110 milliliters on average, compared to 176 milliliters with abdominal myomectomy and shorter hospital stays of about one day, compared with more than two days in the hospital for abdominal myomectomy. This conference coverage from the 2011 Annual Meeting of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, held April 30th through May 4th in Washington, D.C., is presented by ReachMD on XM Satellite Radio, and by live stream at ReachMD.com, and powered by Health Day. <laughs>